Radio, your number one business radio. Good evening and welcome to the headline on Broad Street Radio. My name is Regina Agada. With the election season coming up, I have seen a number of hopefuls and aspirants vying for the presidential position. And uh, today on the headline, we'll be having an exclusive chat with a presidential aspirant, a PDP presidential aspirant, Mazi Sam Ohabunwa. He has served on various advisory boards, as well as he is the former CEO of Nemeth Pharmaceuticals. So good evening, sir. Good evening. Okay. Pleasure. Nice to have you on the show today. Thank you. All right, so we'll go straight into our conversation for the evening. Um, te- over 35 aspirants have officially joined the race to become uh, Nigeria's president, with also no fewer than ele- um, 18 aspirants from your party, that is the People's uh, Democratic Party. So what sets your intention to run for presidency different from others, considering the state of the Nigerian political atmosphere currently? Well, I come from a different queue, uh, um, different perspective. If you check most of the people in the race, especially in, in PDP, there are people who have uh, been there a long time uh, and all we can see is what we are seeing. So I'm coming with a perspective that I'm coming with a private sector uh, person, but who is also grounded in the norms and understanding of the workings of the public sector. Private sector orientation perspective. I bring the discipline that is in the private sector. I bring the orderliness and corporate governance in the private sector. I bring the accountability that is the private sector. I bring performance that is in the private sector. Because in private sector, we don't promote you because you've been here five years. We promote you because you've been able to accomplish stated objectives. In the private sector, we're accountable because as CEO, you are accountable to the board, you are accountable to the AGM on a regular basis. So performance, if you don't perform, you're not moving forward. And secondly, if you are not able to account for every resource that has been put into your care, you may be removed. And like I said, the discipline and the orderliness. Secondly, I also come with vision. If you check most people there, and I've gone around the country, each time I went and showed them my vision, they say, Sam, you're coming differently. You have a vision, you have a plan. Others are just telling us stories or throwing money at us. Uh, but you are the one who knows where you want to go or where you want to take the country to. I come with vision. So I come with vision. I come with competence. I come with character. Because if you check everybody, you see our character. You'll be able to see what level of integrity have we excised. I've run office as chairman of Nigerian Economic Summit Group, president of NACA, chairman of MAN, Ikeja, CEO of Pfizer, past president from the School Society of Nigeria, president of Nigeria American Chamber of Commerce, and so forth and so on. You need to go back and see what did we do there? What do we come out with? What scandals, what uh, accusations are following us? These are things that indicate that I'm coming with integrity, I'm coming with focus, and I'm also coming with a vision to turn Nigeria from a third world to a first world. I don't know anybody who has that kind of aggressive uh, vision. I believe that this will enable Nigeria to see that coming with that vision, I intend to turn Nigeria into a prosperous nation, from poverty to prosperity, from injustice to justice, from insecurity to security, and from corruption to integrity. This is what I bring that I think stands me out, because it's not a question of speaking, but if you look at my background, it prepares me for this assignment. All right, sir. Um, with uh, the track record that you've given, um, I'm sure you're also aware that becoming a president of Africa's most populous nation is no easy task. Yeah. And uh, it's definitely a big role to take on. So can you share with us uh, some of the instances where you've taken decisive actions uh, that exemplifies you as a true leader? Well, so many. So many. First is that... Um, I joined Pfizer 
and I rose from um, the first level from a school sales rep and became chairman and CEO, a regional manager for Pfizer West Africa. Rising to that displays your leadership skill, shows your managerial skill, and your steward skill, ability to handle, and your vision, because you cannot achieve uh, those heights without vision. That is one. Number two, in 1997, Pfizer decided to divest from Nigeria. And I was challenged as CEO of Pfizer to organize what is called a management buyout of Pfizer Inc. shares in Pfizer uh, products PLC. And I managed to lead management to acquire the 60% shareholding in Pfizer and arranged the intermediation of funds that enabled us to pay millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars to Pfizer Inc. to be able to acquire those shares. And having paid that money, we were able to pay back all the money we borrowed that enables us to achieve this uh, to the bank uh, and, 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 and then acquire the shares and we'll run with the shares. Mm. Uh, I have been at specific junctions in um, when I joined NECA, when I was president of NECA, I laid the foundation of the NECA Plaza and I was able to generate the resources that enabled us to complete the building in four years. So I laid the generation, I, I laid the foundation, and I also um, was able to bring it to completion and commission, uh, commission. Everywhere I've gone, when I was chairman of Nigeria Economic Summit Group, I was able to uh, also move, live the place better than I met it. All these groups are multi-ethnic, multi-professional, uh, and I've been able to wheel them together and run successful, both in terms of profit and non-profit organization. I'm just the immediate past president of the Foreign Society of Nigeria. When I came to the society, there were issues of certain parts of the country not being well represented in the running and administration of. By the time I was leaving, we've been able to create a level playing ground for a lot of people to uh, uh, participate. So. Everywhere I've gone, I've set vision, which is primary for leadership. I've set direction. I have also modeled behavior. I've motivated and created successful and painless succession because succession planning is critical for leadership. They say you are not a successful leader until you have had a successful successor. So uh, my ability to transit in MAN, in Keja, in NECA, uh, National, MAN, and uh, Nigeria Economic Summit Group, Nigeria American Chamber of Commerce, Society of Nigeria. Very peaceful transition. It's indication of the ability to discover talent and nurture talent, which is another leadership issue. Nurture talent uh, and get talent to be able to uh, participate. Finally, on the political scene, for example, uh, when I was um, a member of the National Political Reform Conference in 2005, you know, when we're discussing um, uh, derivation, the, the, the North, the South, the South South had to walk away from the conference because um, especially our Northern colleagues were not able to accede to their request. It was by my own motion and by my effort to intermediate between the South South and the rest of us that we were able to bring the South back into the conference to enable us complete. So there are these are opportunity to show leadership uh, 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 that I can point to. There are many of them, but within the co context of this, I have had opportunities where I had to take leadership decisions uh, that led to accomplishment of goals and objectives. Um, also, sir, you've been very vocal about uh, the security challenges. Uh, in the country, which uh, still poses a uh, serious threat to lives, property, and uh, the economic growth uh, of Nigeria, um, not just by lending your voice, but preferring solutions. And one of them was uh, the deployment of technology. So how do you plan to actualize this, considering the technological state of the country? Well, the, the, the luck we have is that 
we live in a technology age. The 21st century is the age of knowledge and technology. Secondly, is that there is great innovation going around the world. And this innovation is leading to miniaturization of technology. It's leading to um, fast ad adoption and adaptation, and then also creating affordability. So we intend to acquire technology from where we have them. There are countries in Germany, countries like Germany, countries like United States of America, countries like Israel, countries that have faced the kind of security challenges we have faced and are still facing. Um, and they've been able to contain those because they've applied technology. I like give in the United States example. You know, today, <laughs> you, you, you don't need to confront an army physically to take them out. Beyond the ability to bomb, beyond the ability to send missiles, mm -hmm. today we have armored drone that can carry armor to you and deal with the, with the person and dissolve the, the opposition. Are you getting me? So that's the kind of technology we're going to apply. And Nigeria has the resources. Nigeria has the resources to get these things acquired and utilized. And even if we didn't have the resources, if we borrowed, you know, today we're borrowing money. Yes. For all kinds of things. <laughs> if the borrowing was to deal with, uh, with uh, a, a security issue, I'm sure Nigerians won't be very, very unhappy. However, we wouldn't even need to borrow because part of our primary response our objective is to drive Nigeria through an accelerated productive process that will turn Nigeria into uh, an industrial hub, will turn Nigeria into an agricultural processing hub, will turn Nigeria into an ICT processing hub, will turn Nigeria into where we are optimizing our opportunities to have arts, culture, dance, drama, and not to talk about solid minerals. So there's going to be so much productivity that we'll have the resources. Diversify foreign exchange earning, which you can pay for technology, for security, and other forms of activities. Um, uh, also, sir, you've also mentioned uh, poverty being one of the four demons of yeah. OD Nigeria captive. So yeah. how do you plan to tackle poverty in, uh, in Nigeria with the current st uh, statistics showing that an estimate of 42.6% uh, Percent that is 95.1 million Nigerians are currently living below poverty line. So, how do you plan to address that if elected president? I'm going to deal with poverty in diverse ways, and they'll be done simultaneously. First is to change our educational paradigm, the educational philosophy. Most people that go to tertiary institutions go to prepare themselves to come and look for work. We're going to change it. When you go to a tertiary institution, you are going to come out from school with two things. First, you learn how to solve problems. You learn how to create wealth. With that, whatever professional subject, you must use it to create wealth and solve problems. Final year students will come out with two business plans. Their final year will be developing business plans, not doing this kind of projects that most times nobody uses them. After you've passed it, they just Get dump it on you. You come out with your business plans. And we're going to set up what we call Small Business Development Authority, where you're going to take your business plans to in each local government. They will look at your business plan, look at which one of them is more market-oriented, has more market acceptability. They give you aid to go and try it. If you go and try it and there is a market future, you come back. And this Small Business Development Authority will lead you to a funding agency, either to venture capital, to equity share, equity holders, or to debt both multilateral, multilateral, developmental debt. There are different segments of debt, depending on the kind of business and the kind of fungibility and then the cash flow. If we find that you are having difficulty acquiring these facilities or loans and government believes that there is a lot of potential in this, your business, maybe you're going to create jobs, you're going to create wealth, government will partner with you by offering you help, either in forms of giving you um, asset like land and then be your partner the moment your business begins to generate cash flow government will start taking the investment it has made in your business government would like not to burden young entrepreneurs with upfront capital expenditure 
you spend 100, 100 million to buy land. Who will you get the 100 million? So government will be partners. And my whole drive is to make sure that people have businesses and have jobs. Because each business you create, as I keep saying, the, the whole summation of our economic drive is to turn Nigeria into an investment heaven, investment hub. Investments will come from external, will promote local investment. These investments will create businesses. They will create projects. They will create programs. Now, programs, businesses, and projects will create jobs. Jobs will create wealth. Wealth will drive away poverty. It's a straight line thing. So our principal objective is to support the private sector because the private sector brings investment. will turn Nigeria into a preferential investment destination. So if you have one dollar in the United States, are you Nigerian diaspora? Are you a Chinese? Are you an Indian? And you want to come to Africa? Where am I going to go to Africa? Nigeria will call you. Because one, you find that we have a country with a stable climate, stable policy. We have a bucket of incentives. And we have potentials in agriculture, in solid minerals, in oil and gas, in, in, in creative industry, in entertainment. So there's a bundle of areas you can come and invest and you are sure that your return will be better than anywhere else, and your investment will be protected, that will attract investment, and Nigeria will turn into a productive hub that will create wealth. And that is how to deal with the economic uh, uh, issues, take poverty, and turn Nigeria into a prosperous nation. Um, you seem to have quite uh, the plan for tertiary mm -hmm. Uh, education. So, considering the state of uh, the Nigerian tertiary education with NASU being on strike and the Senior Staff Association mm -hmm. being on strike, as well as, well as ASU, and as a matter of fact, ASU extended its warning strike uh, yeah. today. Uh, what is your vision for the Nigerian educational sector uh, in general, or my most vision, particularly my vision, tertiary education? My vision, I've already first is going to we're going to change the paradigm, the philosophy of education. We're not going to be training people to come and become part of the problem. We're going to create people who come and solve problems. So educational orientation will be different. No lecturer will come into the class and spend one hour talking, teaching. Uh, no. 30 minutes, he will give you a lecture. 30 minutes, the class is solving a problem. I've already told you that in your final, you're going to come out with your business plan. Two business plans. That's what you spend your whole year doing, researching, going to the industry, doing whatever you need to make sure you have a business plan that is fungible and workable. Number two, we are going to uh, you know, uh, create opportunity for those who have, uh, who, want to, uh, uh, who want to assess education to get them. So there's going to be liberal scholarship, liberal bursary awards, and liberal student loans so that those whose parents cannot afford to send their pay for their children, they will have loan. And so that when they finish, it's done elsewhere in the world. Fourthly, we are going to incentivize um, um, the, the tertiary education. It will not just be a consumption um, institution. Because today, part of the problem of tertiary education, ASU, is ASU is dependent on government to provide everything. Now, we're going to turn these institutions into money-making ventures. We want to link them to industry. They will be providing research and development facilities for the industry. Industry will pay. And because they are receiving independent funding, the money they get from government will, be, will therefore be leveraged to meet their needs in terms of infrastructure, in terms of paying the, the workers and the lecturers um, and, and all that. Third, uh, fifthly, is that there going to be a higher level of um, um, tertiary education and diversified and decentralized. There's no reason federal government will own 1,000 universities. None of them is being well funded. We we'll own 1,000 hospitals. None of them is being well funded. Federal government will take what it can manage. State government will take what it can manage. Local government will take what it can manage. Then we incentivize the private sector to take the rest. And what we we'll do with the private sector is they are contributing to the healthcare education. We would then pass some subsidy to them. Because the reason why people can't go to a good 
tertiary institution uh, is because the funding is uh, the, 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 the school fees is high. Federal government cannot walk away because the manpower those institutions are providing are not going to be Chinese manpower or Arabian manpower, they are Nigerian manpower. So whether it's being produced by public school or private school, Nigerian government must have interest and make contribution. The one that is public school, they are funding fully. The one that is private school, other people are doing it, but they give them subsidy so that they don't charge commercial rates or rates that will be unaffordable. Today, if you want to go to some of these private schools, you know it's only for big men. But poor man can go when we come because we are going to create a win-win situation for private sector and government. Because we know that when things are managed by the private sector, they have better sustainability. They manage them better. Unlike public sector institutions that are looked as no man's uh, uh, property. So in our regime, we're going to use the private sector to support government. And we use government to support the private sector. Jointly, we'll create the best uh, opportunities for us. Is it in healthcare? Is it in education? Is it in population control? Is it in industry? Is it in agriculture? It will be partnership with the uh, public sector, knowing that its job is to create and facilitate the private sector. Um, also, sir, with regards to skilled migration, mm -hmm. I'm sure it's no longer news that most of our skilled professionals are already leaving to more advanced countries where they feel like they have a chance at a better future. So what are your plans to address the root cause of uh, you know, the mass migration of our skilled workers? The root cause of mass migration of our skilled workers are certainly two or three. One is lack of satisfaction. Lack of satisfaction. In fact, that's captured it all. But this can be broken first is that the operating environment is not ennobling. It's not motivating. It's not satisfying. So we're going to create an ennobling environment that will give value. It, it will draw from a policy of re restoring the human dignity. Because in Nigeria, we have found that Nigerians, Nigeria seem to have lost. A, a typical Nigerian has no dignity anymore. Whether you're skilled or unskilled, the less skilled you are, the less you are, you are, you become a forgotten identity. So we will create an ennobling environment, a motivating environment for a medical doctor, for a pharmacist, for an engineer, for uh, an artist. The country will show that they value you. Because the greatest thing that a human being needs is recognition and acceptance that you are making a contribution. So the country will create an opportunity for every skill that you have. There is a weight that shows that that skill is necessary. And that is reflected by not just recognition, by your compensation. Now, most uh, skilled manpower are, are migrating or immigrating because their earning is poor, it's not competitive. They are better paid elsewhere. So they go where they're better paid. I mean, when I finished school, I went straight to work. Three months after they work, and I got a car loan. One year or two years after, uh, when I finished my internship and youth call, joined Pfizer, Three months, I got a, a new car offered to me as an official car. I was a three-year pharmacist with three, two cars in my garage. I didn't do Yahoo. I didn't do 419. I didn't take the products of the company around the way. So today, five-year graduates can't buy a car. They can't own a house. We will introduce all this. And to be able to do so, Nigeria will be sure that we pay people living wages. I have proposed that one of the things we're going to do, we're going to index salaries to devaluation and to inflation. If inflation goes more than 5%, we increase salaries. If devaluation goes more than 10%, we increase salaries. Automatic. It, we're not going to wait for NLC or NUC or us to go on strike. Because the idea is to maintain standard of living and purchasing power. Because if, you're, if Naira devalues, you lose purchasing power and you are being driven further into poverty. The only way you can maintain your is to, in, to increase your salary in local currency. And that is why I say that no country should devalue its currency except it hopes to get an incremental income. Why do you devalue? You devalue to make your export cheaper. Now, if you have oil, which is priced in dollar, is there any benefit devaluing? 
It's where you're selling agricultural products, selling other things that are indigenous, arts and culture, music, dance, entertainment, uh, television. You know, those are the kind of things that if you devalue, you become cheaper. And then it means the volume will go high. So you earn more money. That gives you the opportunity to increase people's salary. Um, also, sir, as a key stakeholder in the pharmaceutical sector, and uh, having said as a, me a member of the national, a board member of the National Health Insurance Scheme, yeah. uh, what should the electorates expect from you uh, in terms of uh, the health sector as well? Well, the thing with the health sector today is that the health sector is not well funded. And the reason it's not well funded is that government thinks the health sector is its own. Mm -hmm. And national health insurance is run by government. Everything, no, we are going to turn the health sector into a, like any other business sector. We're going to make it attractive for investments. Investments in terms of hardcore, people to put hospitals, laboratories, pharmacies, that's hardcore. We're also going to make it attractive for soft core, which is professionals, the neurosurgeons, the clinical pharmacists, the microbiologists, uh, the atomic, the biomedical scientists. They will come when there is money. Everybody follows the money. That's it. So we're going to make the healthcare, the cash flow in the healthcare to be high. And so I'm going to work to get the, to the government contribute to a pool. The private sector contributes to a pool through health insurance. All of us here in health insurance, you are paying some money every month. You've been taking from salary into a pool. From that pool, you can pay a neurosurgeon when you need him. An ENT, a clinical pharmacist, uh, a, 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 a scientific uh, a analyst. But if the money is not there to pay, he's waiting for when you can come and bring money from your pocket. And many of us don't have money especially when we're sick. Because many of us are paid as you go. So if the day you're sick, you don't go to work, you earn money. Of course. So when you're sick, how would they say, put money down before we treat you? That's what, you, so which, which doctor will stay when he's not sure of his earning? But if there's an insurance that guarantees there's money in the system, every, everybody will stay because any day uh, 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 somebody comes with a broken eardrum, or you come with a broken brain, they will do surgery. Money will be paid to insurance. That is the way it is done. So we're going to increase, our focus will be to increase the cash flow. And we're going to get the private sector, the governmental sector, the non-governmental sector, the NGOs, everybody contributing to this post so that from that post, we can take care of our healthcare. That's the major issue. It is that there is not enough money. That's why I name it goes on strike. After Ene goes, he comes back, Johes will go, another group will go. That is what we have seen for over several years. And we're going around in a circle. And these same people who say they are leaders cannot find a solution to it. Is it to the ASU strikes that I started? Since you were born, how many ASU strikes have you had about? Sometimes one year they don't go to work, yet at the end they get paid. This one they already finished, they're starting three months. Yeah. At the end they'll be paid though. After we lost the manpower, lost man hours, lost disrupted the life of young people who cannot continue their education that's also what what helps immigration or migration because people can't go to school they don't know when they will finish what is if you go elsewhere if it's a four-year course a four-year course a six year so i'm here you can do seven year course for three year course that is what is wrong with our country when i speak about making nigeria become a globally competitive world i am saying can we make Nigeria be like the rest of the world in terms of our systems, in terms of our behavior, in terms of how we conduct our lives? It's been great having this chat with you, sir. Um, I hope to see you at the polls as well. All right, that wraps up our interview with PDP presidential aspirant Mazi Sam Ohabunwa. See you next on another edition of The Headline on Broad Street Radio. Good evening. Radio, your number one business radio.